Hello, and welcome to the B2IP webinar series, hosted by Bijan Bienemann. Bijan Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. I'm Peter Kiros, and today my colleague Tom Bijan will be discussing recent developments in patent damages. Today's webinar has been approved for CLE credit in several states. In the middle of the presentation, we will announce a polling question that will show up on your screen. If you are seeking CLE credit, please be sure to answer the question before the presentation concludes. On your screen, you will find a Q&A and chat feature. Please leave all questions in either of these boxes, and we will answer them at the end. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Good uh, afternoon, everyone, and, and good morning uh, to everyone who's in uh, Western uh, time zones. Today, uh, our presentation is on uh, the latest uh, trends and issues involved with patent damages, and uh, we're going to discuss relative to some of these cases that we're going to talk about how that might relate to uh, preparing and developing patent applications on the front end and what impact that might have on damage calculations on the back end. In looking at uh, recent uh, cases and recent damage theories that people and litigants have proposed, uh, one thing becomes apparent, which is what is old is new. A lot of the damage theories that are being advocated for in modern and current patent litigation have historical roots in cases that are quite old. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the foundational cases and the impact that they have today. And where the, the push and pull uh, with respect to these damage theories comes in often uh, relates to Daubert and the admissibility of theories. So we'll touch on that uh, as well. So this is a, a brief uh, agenda, which uh, if you ask for the slides, will give you some uh, framework about what we're going to be talking about. Before we get into the merits, uh, PwC every year uh, publishes a patent litigation study, and that patent litigation study includes a treasure trove of pragmatic statistical information, not only about the size of awards, but the jurisdiction in which those awards are uh, happening, and also comparisons between operating entities and non-operating entities, jury trials, and non-jury trials. I think it should come as not much of a surprise that jury verdicts for patent infringement are going to be better than, than bench uh, verdicts. And with respect to these jury verdicts, if you are a patent holder with compelling story to tell, um, many juries are going to trend towards the theories that, that you put forth. So we're going to start with lost profit damages. As a patent holder, if you're a practicing entity, the lost damages, lost profits as a damage calculation will be preferable over a reasonable royalty calculation. And the reason for this is simple, that on a per unit basis, the numbers uh, are going to be higher. So the test that's the most widely uh, cited is the Panduit uh, test. It's a Sixth Circuit decision from 1978. It sets forth a four-factor test to calculate and determine whether incremental profits should be awarded. That test sets forth but for causation. It's not the sine qua non test, so it's not the sort of essential test, and we'll see that when we discuss the right height case later. But with respect to lost profits, the patent holder has the burden of proof to show demand for the patented product, absence of acceptable non-infringing substitutes, manufacturing and marketing 
capability to exploit that demand and the amount of profit that the patent holder uh, would have made. Incremental uh, profits are profits that are net. So incremental meaning it's the next unit that the patent holder would sell. So the costs that would be attributable to allocate against the next sale would only be uh, variable costs. And in the Panduit case itself, ironically, lost profits were not awarded. Only a reasonable royalty was awarded. The deficiency in the proofs by uh, the patent holder was that the patent holder did not adequately set forth what its cost of goods were in order to prove what the incremental uh, profit would have been. Oftentimes, in terms of expert analysis, the financials and the effort to show factors three and four of the test can be quite involved to show that the facilities have the capacity to meet the excess demand. They have the ability to go out and capture that excess demand and to show what the profits actually would be. The absence of non-infringing substitutes is not necessarily a bar to have some portion of the infringing units be subject to a lost profits analysis. And we're going to get into that in a minute. So the, the big issues with respect to a lost profits analysis, absence of non-infringing alternatives, we've touched on these. And oftentimes with respect to a loss profit and profits analysis like reasonable royalty analysis that we'll discuss later in the presentation, Daubert is in play. And uh, for those in the audience who are not familiar with Daubert, Daubert is a U.S. Supreme Court case that acknowledges or sets forth the fact that the trial judge is the gatekeeper of opinion evidence. So if an expert opinion is going to be offered, uh, theories may uh, prove to be uh, inadmissible simply because they may be too speculative or they may be outside the framework of the law. Uh, and we will uh, see this later on in the uh, presentation as well. So with respect to non-infringing acceptable non-infringing alternates. The K and there's a, this is just one of many cases and this uh, remains a trend uh, and sort of a well-established principle in modern patent damage law. Uh, this case is representative. Crystal Semiconductor versus uh, Tritech Microelectronics Federal Circuit 2001. The case involved uh, three competitors the infringing products uh, were aimed at a high quality market. However, there were non-infringing substitutes that existed and there was sort of a market split. The jury came back and awarded <clears throat> lost profits on 35% of the sales made by the sales made by the um, accused infringer and a reasonable royalty on the 65% uh, balance. The district court granted JMOL eliminating the lost profits. The Federal Circuit uh, reversed the uh, decision. And so this uh, is a situation where the fact that there were acceptable non-infringing alternate simply created a marketplace division. Uh, oftentimes, a party seeking lost profits may not use their uh, damage expert as the vehicle to present evidence with respect to what the market share is uh, to determine that division between 
lost profits and reasonable royalty. That evidence may come from uh, documents. Uh, I've seen this happen before where there's market share documents that have been uh, admissible and used to divide the market share for the split between reasonable royalty and lost profits. The, the situation where I've seen document used, documents came from the accused infringer. And so this made it uh, difficult for the accused infringer to uh, argue that the division was incorrect. So here, just to summarize, where there is an acceptable non-infringing substitute, the market uh, share theory can be used to determine the split. <clears throat> and here we're talking about sort of back to the foundational principle of but-for causation that using market share information, the patent holder can say, but for the accused infringer, they would have captured lost profits as to that market share, but they would not necessarily have captured the other portion of the market. Convoy sales and derivative sales. This is a 1995 en banc decision from the Federal Circuit, Wright Height versus Kelly. Uh, the, some of the cases you see right now coming out, including uh, the power integrations uh, case, which we'll discuss later, that's received a lot of uh, notoriety, notoriety in uh, IP360 and other uh, places. They all have their origin in this idea of convoyed or derivative sales. So we talk about but for causation, but for the infringement, what would be the harm to the practicing entity uh, patent holder. And here the facts were that Wright Height sold a device called the MDL55 uh, that was a loading dock device. Wright Height claimed that Kelly infringed with its product, the truck stop but sought damages with respect to two additional um, products. They said that the ADL100 sales, which were, was a non-patented product, was affected by Wright Heights infringement. And also, Wright Height claimed damages for an unrelated uh, dock leveler uh, situation. So at the extreme sentiment, uh, one might think that because the ADL was 100 was not patented, the dock leveler was not patented, there would be no damages for either. However, the uh, Supreme Court in a case, General Motors versus DVEX, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation with respect to uh, prejudgment and post-judgment interest, indicated that the scope of Section 284 was to provide a full uh, compensation. And in this case, that full compensation, there were damages awarded because it was, you know, the proofs uh, included both uh, foreseeability and the proofs also included, you know, the, the relationship and the drip, you know, the fact that the, but for the infringement the damages wouldn't have occurred. The number, uh, the district court found that Kelly was liable for the ADL 100 loss and the leveler uh, loss. And here you can see in the middle bullet point, which is a, a quote from the, the court, the patentee need only show. So the outcome of this ultimately was that the uh, Federal Circuit on Bank found in, that the damages for the sales of the ADL 100 were appropriate to include, but the levelers were not. And we'll go through uh, within the presentation why that is the case. So here the the uh, the court looked at the Panduit analysis 
indicating that the second factor that the ADL 100 was a substitute, but it was only available from right height, and thus right height would have lost its sales. So the, the court found that the second factor was met. But importantly, and this is driving some of the later cases, including you know the inclusion that district courts have granted uh, damages for foreign sales and the federal circuit reversed, uh, which we'll see down the, later in the presentation, foreseeability was an important part. The second bullet point from the federal circuit is important. The court determined that right height lost sales of the ADL 100, a product that directly competed with the infringing product, and that those losses were reasonably foreseeable. So the court in right height relative to convoy sales is treating damages separate from infringement. However, the court did not find the same with respect to the dock levelers. And again, the second uh, bullet point is important. Although the two devices may have been used together, they did not function together to achieve one result. The court also, in this respect, talked about the difference between where the product was sold for convenience versus where the product was sold as a function as a because it was functionally related so here the uh, ADL 100s were physically displaced sort of a separate product only available from right height and those sales were but for lost, where the sales of the dock levelers were purely for a business convenience. And I remember at the time when this case came out, it created a lot of uh, confusion as to the division, how the, on the one hand, the court allowed the lost profits for the ADL 100, but then did not allow the profits for the dock levelers. And this case did have a couple uh, dissents. So I'm going to skip forward, but I want to read from you a couple things from the case itself. So this is uh, within the case, and I'll, I'll quote it. Uh, we believe that under 284 of the patent statute, the balance between full compensation, which is the meaning of the Supreme Court is attributed to the statute, and the reasonable limits of liability encompassed by general principles of law can be best viewed in terms of reasonable objective foreseeability. A particular injury was or should have been reasonably foreseeable by infringing competitor in the relevant market broadly defined, that injury is generally compensatable absent a persuasive reason to the contrary. The persuasive reason to the contrary for the dock levelers was that the dock leveler sales were part and parcel of Wright Heights total, all, total overall activity simply as a function of business advantage or convenience, and the consumers could have bought this uh, dock leveler anywhere they wanted. However, getting the ADL 100 not infringing or not patented product, that only could have come from, from right height. So it went beyond uh, simple uh, convenience in terms of whether the profits were awarded. Fast forward to a case that just went round two to the federal circuit. So this was the round one, which is foreign sales. So the power integrations case involved chargers for cell phones. 
And these chargers for cell phones were sold on a global uh, basis. And at the district court, the patent holder, Power Integrations, established foreseeability that but for the infringement, it would have sold and did lose sales on a, a global uh, basis. Power Integrations uh, was awarded $33 million total, and you can see in this slide that ultimately the, the district court reduced this significantly, and then it went up on appeal. So the breakup of this uh, damage award was four, almost $15 million due to lost sales, $2 million of price erosion, and then additional uh, damages for a lump sum uh, royalty. This case, I think, illustrates the, the dynamic underneath. So the Federal Circuit, you know, just in terms of the background of this, and this uh, case involved a bifurcated trial. So the, the infringement suit, the first uh, trial, there was two trials, first addressing infringement and damages and willfulness, and then the next trial of, uh, addressing only uh, validity. So in the, in the trial uh, situation, you have uh, Fairchild, in my opinion, at a pretty significant disadvantage because they're just saying, you know, we don't infringe. They can't say the patent's invalid. They, you know, we didn't willfully infringe it, and they got clobbered. And they got clobbered to the point where the judge uh, did remit the award pretty significantly. In the appeal, uh, power integrations focused on the factors of right height and the factors of General Motors versus DVEX and the factors starting with Panduit, that this was entirely foreseeable that when the Fairchild Semiconductor Company started selling their uh, power chargers that they would lose sales on a global basis. And the Federal Circuit, in pretty short words, uh, simply said no, that this is uh, not the case. Um, the underlying question here remains whether power integrations is entitled to compensatory damages for injury caused by infringing activity that occurred outside the territory of the United States? The answer is no. And the court here uh, drew a extraterritorial line saying, if it's within the United States, we're going to look at it maybe a little bit differently uh, as, we, as we did in uh, right height. But if it is outside the United States, there's simply going to be a bright line rule that there's going to be no uh, infringement, and thus no damages. The power integrations case also discussed price erosion, which uh, can be a pretty potent uh, additional factor within a damage theory. Here, there was a remitting of the damage award by the district court due to uh, what the district court thought was improper proofs on price erosion. So this diagram before you sets forth the relevant facts. So on the far left, you see that the patent issued, but power integrations not marking. So they're not in compliance with Section 287 of the patent statute. Fairchild then begins its infringement, but that infringement is pre-notice. The vertical line towards the middle is the you know, actual notice of infringement, and then we have the accumulation of damages. So what the district court found 
was that the price erosion proofs had to start when notice happened. And power integrations argued that the they could use all of uh, Fairchild's infringing activity to determine price erosion. They could look to the pre-notice activity to determine price erosion, and that the price erosion damages should be uh, part and parcel of the green arrow, saying that they should be able to recover the difference in price that as it was eroded. And here, the Federal Circuit did find that pre-notice infringement does is admissible to prove price erosion, but the price erosion damages can only flow after notice. So again, uh, creating a distinction between Section uh, 287 and 284 of the, the patent uh, statute. Here is the second uh, bullet is a quote, price erosion analysis relating to damages arising from post-notice infringement must measure price changes against infringement free market conditions and thus the proper starting point of such a price erosion analysis is the date of first uh, infringement. So they're going to allow the, the district court to go back and look at the full conditions under which the price was eroded. Price erosion damages can be pretty significant because they aren't necessarily uh, tied to the one-to-one -one sales of the accused infringer. So if a larger seller uh, is forced to decrease their prices across a, a larger uh, universe of sales, those two can be recoverable. So let's say you have a, a large infring, a large seller that's selling 10 units for every one of the accused infringer, but the accused infringer uh, offering at a lower price forces the larger player to drop its prices to meet them in the market to avoid uh, loss of sales. That can be compensated for. That scenario uh, also highlights the importance of having a good damage expert uh, because if the lower prices increase demand for the, the product, the, the overall harm to the patent holder may be reduced by larger uh, volume sales. So the, all, the entire market uh, needs to be evaluated. I also want to touch on future lost profits, um, which will be our last uh, slides for the lost profit section. This is a case that I found to be you know, very interesting. Again, sort of allowing uh, damages to go beyond the traditional window that one might associate with the patent grant. So this was a summary judgment motion that was denied that the summary judgment motion was that the plaintiff Magna's damage theory that they should be awarded money for harm past the expiration of the patent should be awarded. TRW moved for summary judgment uh, relying on the Kimball versus Marvel Entertainment case. You'll recall that the Kimball versus Marvel Entertainment case found that a, a royalty arrangement that went beyond the expiration of the patent was unenforceable. Um, it was a 50-year term on a license deal. Uh, the district court here allowed that uh, theory to go forward. So here the, you know, the theory was simple, that the, within the automotive uh, marketplace, there has to be a certain amount of, there's a certain run-up to uh, 
get the business going, that run-up is infringement, and that run-up needed to start after the expiration. It started before, so that TRW came into the market uh, several uh, months earlier. And so it, the, the harm went past the expiration of the patent because TRW was sort of improperly accelerated into the marketplace. And uh, that went to the, you know, that, that, that case settled, but that uh, Judge Maloney allowed that to go to the jury. So with respect to damages on lost profits, and we'll see this continue uh, through, but maybe less so with reasonable royalty, there are a wide variety of damage theories premised on foreseeability and operating patent holders continue to press you know, the boundaries of that. Uh, in Wright Height versus Kelly, we see the ability to uh, seek damages based on convoyed sales or collateral sales, but sales that are not made simply for convenience. In the uh, power integrations case, we see that being pushed to the boundary where a district court allowed a extraterritorial theory involving foreign sales go to the jury, the jury awarded damages, and then the, the district court trimmed that back, and the Federal Circuit affirmed that that wasn't uh, an appropriate uh, theory in the first place. So I think that in many ways, if you're, the law still provides pretty significant advantages to a practice and entity seeking sort of lost profits type damages to seek price erosion, collateral sales, and, and move forward. However, in the underlying analysis, uh, I would say the overwhelming number of district courts do focus their attention on the gatekeeping function of Daubert relative to whether those theories should go to the jury. So this is our uh, polling uh, question <clears throat> for CLE credit. What state is Bijan Bienemann uh, located? Um, we're opening the poll now. And it'll remain open through the, the balance of the uh, presentation and um, you know, one, that'll be for CLE credit. All right, you're locked in. So now we're going to move to reasonable royalty damages. So the statute says that upon finding for the claimant, the court shall award the claimant damages adequate to compensate for the infringement, but no event less than a reasonable royalty. So the first part of our presentation was focusing on the case law related to compensating for infringement, lost profits, and the variety of theories. We're now going to move to the reasonable royalty, which is the floor for infringement. Panduit sets forth, you know, sort of the public policy for setting the reasonable uh, royalty, and I'll leave it uh, to you to uh, read Panduit. I think it even today is pretty instructive. But here, the, 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 the uh, tension is that it can be viewed as a compulsory license. So the, the court, in looking at, you know, if it's after the fact, where the sort of infringer sort of got away with it and paid a reasonable royalty, that's on the one side of it. On the other side is what would or wouldn't uh, parties agree to at the front end. And so that's what we're going to talk about. The most widely cited case for reasonable royalty analysis is Georgia Pacific. It involves a 17-factor test. Uh, the factors are not all equally important. We'll run through these factors very quickly. Uh, factors one and two here, rates paid, Courts find uh, comparable licenses 
very persuasive, but as we'll see in later cases, uh, not all other license rates are in fact going to be admissible because a district court, again, under Daubert, might find that those are not comparable and may be prejudicial to uh, one side or the other. With respect to uh, factors five and six, we see this more with, so this is the commercial relationship between the parties and then the effect of selling patented items, promoting the sale of other items. Uh, experts can use these between involving practicing entities to elevate the uh, royalties and in my experience district courts uh, do find that those five and six between practicing entities can be persuasive to have a higher rate. The factors seven through ten often are not a big deal within uh, district courts sort of I would say more often than not a push. Eleven through uh, fourteen uh, the 12 and 13, again, you know, are important, with 13 being the most litigated factor that's going on currently. The portion of the realizable profit that, would, that should be credited to the invention as distinguished from non-patented elements. So this is where we see a lot of uh, current case law with respect to apportionment and smallest saleable unit, what part of the infringement should be awarded to the invention versus the overall sales. And I think in terms of, you know, the standard thinking amongst, you know, a lot of the, the patent practicing uh, community was that, you know, if you have a, a, a patent on a windshield wiper, a la uh, the famous uh, Kearns case that they made a movie out of, you're going to get your uh, royalty to the windshield wiper. You're not going to get your royalty to the whole car, even if your patent claim says, uh, I draft, you know, my, I have an automobile having a you know, windshield and a windshield wiper. And likewise, um, if you have, you know, a computer uh, chip uh, that's found in a phone, you know, the effort is going to be made to align the uh, award or the royalty rate to the chip itself and not to the overall phone. And this gets us into this very recent case, uh, Exmark versus Briggs and Stratton, which kind of changed uh, the thinking of, a little bit relative uh, to this. Uh, the patent in Exmark involved a lawnmower, uh, riding lawnmower, and this had uh, baffles. The patent claim was drawn to a lawnmower with this mower deck and included a lot of uh, conventional features, but the novelty was directed towards the baffle. The claim as we could see in the second uh, bullet point, was directed, however, to the, the lawnmower uh, as a whole. Now, it was true at the, at the um, both at the district court and at the federal circuit that the rec there was recognition that Exmark needed to apportion the value of the baffles from the other conventional components. And prior to Exmark, I think the most common thinking was that the royalty base was where this needed to happen. Uh, that this, uh, the, the value of the baffle needed to be separated 
from the royalty base. So we see this was Briggs's argument uh, at the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit agreed, however, with Exmark's method where they used the entire value of the mower, but they took the uh, apportionment factor and calculated that into the uh, royalty rate. And here the Federal Circuit indicated that there was nothing wrong with uh, doing it this way. And this is in this next slide. So, you know, X mark, the blue being the total value, um, X mark said, look, we're going to have a very small rate uh, applied across the total of the value of the mower. And Briggs said, no, you needed to look at the value of the baffle only and you, you needed, you know, you could have a much higher rate for the value of the baffle, but it had to be, uh, the rate had to be the baffle. Now the Federal Circuit sent this back for a new trial um, because the analysis by Exmark's expert in coming to that little green royalty rate was inadequate, but otherwise it proved that method. So I think uh, certainly, if in, in preparing patent applications, uh, probably a wise idea to give some thought as to whether you can associate your invention uh, in some way with a larger um, item. This is probably how it was done, not probably, this is how it was done in the early 90s when I uh, uh, started practicing uh, patent law, uh, then sort of went out of favor and, and Maybe uh, the Exmark case um, suggests that this is uh, uh, coming back. Now, the other interesting part for damages uh, from the Exmark case is that does Exmark or does delay is it relevant to damages uh, in the sense that maybe the rate should be lower? We all know uh, that that latches is no longer available in patent cases. And here the, the Federal Circuit, uh, consistent with latches no longer being available, uh, found that the delay is not relevant uh, to damages. So the, the Fingen case uh, versus Blue Coat System, also a 2018 case, uh, touches on this uh, smallest saleable unit and treats this in a more uh, conventional uh, factor than, or conventional manner uh, than X marks, seeking to sort of divide out what the royalty base uh, should be. So here this was uh, software uh, patents. Uh, the, the Fingen case also includes an interesting analysis of uh, under 101. So if you're interested in 101 issues, uh, I'd suggest that you uh, read the, the Fingen case. But here's the, you know, the breakup of the damages for the various uh, patents. All uh, with the 844 being reversed, and then under the 731 and the 663 being affirmed. The 968 was reversed for uh, no infringement. So this patent involved this Web Pulse software product that included a, a tremendous uh, number of features. And here, uh, Fingen argued that the smallest saleable or smallest saleable unit needed should correspond to the smallest identifiable technical component that in uh, that uh, included that uh, infringing feature. Fingen didn't, you know, Fingen identified that smallest technical component. However, that smallest technical component still had other non-infringing uses. So here, the Federal Circuit said that with respect to the 844 patent, additional apportionment of the royalty base uh, was necessary. So, you know, 
again, more of a traditional analysis, maybe a little bit different than how the Federal Circuit treated um, the royalty base uh, in the uh, Exmark case. So Finjen, again, going back to our uh, Georgia Pacific factors that we uh, talked about earlier, uh, offered testimony that there would be an $8 per user fee. Uh, the facts of that were that Finjen had uh, won a prior uh, litigation involving a different patent an unrelated patent. That prior uh, litigation sort of set an internal policy within Finjen that they would always ask for eight bucks as a starting point. And it was just sort of plucked from the air uh, as the <laughs> Federal Circuit uh, quoted there in the last bullet point. But the Federal Circuit found that that never should have been presented to the jury. That simply was not reliable under Daubert that the sort of starting point with this prior litigation wasn't a comparable uh, license, it wasn't a comparable result, uh, and therefore that fee uh, was inappropriate. So that Finjen, with respect to that, the uh, 844 patent uh, got hit, um, you know, coming and going. It, it, it uh, was reversed for two reasons. With respect to the other uh, 731 and 663 patents, there the Federal Circuit affirmed the apportionment uh, analysis. And I think that the manner in which they affirmed the apportionment analysis, uh, if you're a, a patent holder seeking a reasonable royalty involving apportionment issues, uh, it's probably the most reliable and it's going to be uh, your path to affirmance. Here, Blue Coat disputed this. So ultimately, uh, the, dis the Blue Coat or Finjen's expert ultimately said that the 663 patent, the royalty base should be 1 24th of the overall value. And for the 731, they said it should be 1 8th. It's like, well, how did they, they get to that number? And how they got to that number was using uh, some blue of uh, Blue Coat's own documents. So Blue Coat had a document that uh, we sort of, um, it's not coming up here in the image. So I'll just describe it to you. So Blue Coat had uh, a document that set for, it was a grid, a 24 block grid. And within that grid, uh, Blue Coat had attributed the various features of the product. And uh, Finjen pointed out that one of those features infringed the 731 patent. And, or, I'm sorry, one of those features infringed the 663 patent. So based on one block out of 24, the uh, expert opined that that was a reasonable apportionment of the royalty base. And with respect to the 731 patent, the, the accusation of infringement was based on three uh, of the uh, 24 blocks, and that's how they got to the 1.8. And so with respect to the, the uh, allocation of royalty base, aligning the proofs with Blue Coat's own documents was found to be uh, very uh, persuasive. Uh, we also see this in this uh, district court case, uh, Artcom Innovations versus Google, which in involved uh, Google Earth. Again, the apportionment, this 13 percent apportionment figure came from a 2008 Google business plan. So with respect to, you know, Google disputed 13%, but the district court in this case found that that dispute really didn't have merit because it came from uh, Google's own documents. And so the, the sort of the practice tip in discovery for uh, cases involving apportionment issues, getting the documents from the accused infringer that 
whether they're business plan documents or other documents, technical documents, sort of dividing up the, the product into its various segments can be very persuasive to the uh, fact finder relative to how apportionment should be done and the uh, district courts, or I'm sorry, the, the Federal Circuit seems to uh, support that idea. Uh, with respect to the ARTCOM case, I did find it interesting that uh, there the district court did allow uh, Nash bargaining to be used as a, as a check. Uh, Nash bargaining uh, can be viewed as a rule of thumb uh, for any of the audience that's uh, familiar with the 25% the rule as a starting point for reasonable royalty that was abolished by the Unilock case, I believe in 07, um, Nash bargaining has taken its lumps too from a Daubert perspective as a rule of thumb to sort of as a out of the air starting point. But here the district court allowed it as a, as a check. So maybe other uh, theories could be used as checks. Uh, we'll see how uh, much courts allow the use of otherwise inadmissible uh, theories to be used as a check. So we've got a couple more cases to talk about real quick and then we can go to um, some questions. So Book of Wisdom, uh, there is no uh, book you can get uh, from Amazon called the Book of Wisdom. The phrase Book of Wisdom comes from a case Sinclair Refining versus Jenkins, uh, 1933 Justice Cardozo uh, case, U.S. Supreme Court. And the Book of Wisdom simply uh, reflects that if time has passed since the infringement, maybe we should take into account the wisdom that actual events teaches us versus trying to have this entirely hypothetical uh, situation where we're uh, putting the parties in the position where they would have been had you know, right at the initiation of infringement. Um, th this uh, Book of Wisdom always uh, intrigues me. I'm familiar with a case that was against Microsoft years ago for the HTML reader. There was a $96 per uh, uh, HTML reader royalty that was awarded and then affirmed by the Federal Circuit. Uh, evidence came in that the uh, HTML reader ultimately became you know, a $1 add-on to Microsoft Word. But nonetheless, uh, the $96 theory went forward. Um, Maybe in hindsight, Microsoft should have pushed this book of wisdom a little bit further uh, from the sense that uh, an expert could have opined that with respect to technology, it is you know, on a progressively uh, cheaper direction. And then the last is uh, uh, prejudgment. Last case here is prejudgment and post-judgment interest. Um, <clears throat> here, the interest awards exceeded the actual damages. And so if you have a case that involves infringement that took, uh, or a case that goes on for a long time, the interest can be uh, significant uh, and experts can uh, be involved with the selection of the rate. It's often uh, selected as the prime rate. There can be a pretty significant analysis well <coughs> relative to the determination of compounding interest. So an expert may offer evidence with respect to how a practicing entity will treat uh, its capital. So dive pretty deeply into the, you know, the treasury department of a large company to see how they treat capital, to see what they do with their, their money. And the, here, uh, at least in the, the General Motors case, which is 1983, they did say that the delay in bringing suit was relevant to determining whether interest should or shouldn't be awarded, uh, maybe appealing to a sense of equity where if a patent holder delayed uh, bringing suit, yes, they should get damages, but they shouldn't maybe be able to, to reap the uh, interest rate uh, at those damages. Uh, so, you know, now there's a Supreme Court case after this, um, 
saying latches is uh, not applicable. And, you know, we'll see how, you know, if there any cases come up uh, where delay relative to interest is further discussed. And with that, that's the last slide. So if, if there are any questions that anyone has, we can get those answered. So we have a, a question. Okay. Are fixed costs typically excluded from cost of go uh, goods sold when determining lost profits? And the answer to that is yes, they absolutely are. Sort of full stop. Let's see. So question, to be clear, are you saying that there is no reason to believe that having a dependent claim, such as the microprocessor of claim one further comprising a cell phone, will increase damages beyond claim one? That's an interesting question. Uh, in the XMARC case, the uh, claim one had the cell phone. Um, I think that with respect to cell phones in particular, I'll, I'll put that aside, but I think if it's in a dependent claim, I think the courts are going to push more towards a royalty base that is aligned with the um, independent claim. I also think that um, having looked you know, a little more deeply within the Exmark case itself, Within that industry, you know, Exmark did present evidence not discussed in the Federal Circuit case that the tradition and custom, if you will, was that people would uh, agree to royalties based on the sale of the overall unit. And as to cell phones, maybe that tradition and custom with brand and all that is in a different direction. Uh, because of concerns of royalty stacking. So I would say that this is going to be um, case by case and with a lot of damage analysis, you'll want to have as much support within your expert opinion to make your theory admissible. Okay, next question. At what point does one need a damages expert pertaining to interest? Is this a judge determination to be determined after determination of infringement or must be brought during uh, the damages uh, portion? Uh, how I can tell you how I've done it. Uh, how I've done it is I've included um, interest in uh, the damage opinion saying this is my damage analysis and I've included it often in my um, damage expert report so that the other side can ask any questions about it if they want. It is a judge issue to be determined after uh, infringement. So um, it would be determined sort of in the same motion, the same post-trial motion practice um, associated with uh, you know, if there's a finding of willful infringement, whether it should be uh, multiplied. Um, we had some damage experts sign up, or some uh, people who do testify for damages uh, signed up on the uh, webinar. I don't, you know, what you know, so what their practice may be in terms of putting it in at the time or after. But I've always included it in the expert reports. Uh, and yes, uh, we will provide the slides uh, after. That's the last question, Peter. Oh. Is, uh, next question, is there something used as a check for a party's own theory or for the opposing party's theory uh, too? Uh, in that Google case, they used the theory which was uh, questionably admissible as a check for their own theory. Um, in terms of 
attacking the other party's theories, uh, more often than not that that attack is going to be under Daubert. So with respect to expert reports, uh, more often than not, I've seen, you know, a damages expert present multiple damages theories. You know, under this theory, the royalty rate would be X, or uh, alternately, I would do that theory where the royalty rate would be maybe you know, half of X, and and to hedge against uh, potential uh, inadmissibility of the theory. I hope that answers the question. Is that I think that's all our questions. I hope everyone enjoyed the uh, presentation. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions, and the slides will be uh, circulated. Thank you for joining us to, for today's B2IP webinar. Eugene Bieneman is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Today's webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, website, and across all of our social media channels. A follow-up email will be sent out shortly with more information on how to obtain CLE credit. Once again, thank you for joining us.